with the force of a tidal wave. Water tore down the Appalachian Mountains, knocked over bridges, and sent homes and people downstream. What was it like to live through Hurricane Helene in North Carolina? What was it like to wake up the day after when the storm passed? And what is the recovery like? Today on Bets and Badges, we will be speaking with a person who we have had on the show before, an American hero, a Gulf War veteran, a retired assistant police chief of Allentown Police Department in Pennsylvania, John Hill. Welcome. Thank you. So, so John, the last time we spoke with you, uh, you you had said, you know, you share with us the story of your experiences out in Gulf combat. You share with us your experiences on the street, um, some harrowing scenes that police officers respond to that the public seldom gets an, you know, an opportunity to see the insight of how it impacts the officers and the community. But now, brother, it seems like you have been involved in one more war, one more battle, this one of nature. Talk to us a little bit about it and tell us what you went through when Hurricane Helene slammed through your community. Surreal is probably the best description. I mean, I lived through a hurricane when I lived up in Maine. And I, I was working when Sandy hit. And we had a homicide in the middle of that. And I thought that was about as weird as it was going to get for me dealing with hurricanes because moving to Western North Carolina, you know, in Charleston, you know, hurricanes were every summer. You know, you, that was you Charleston, just where? Down there. Charleston, South Carolina, you know, you just prepared for hurricanes every summer and you just kind of get the marina ready and, and kind of just deal with what mother nature threw at you. So then when we moved to the mountains in North Carolina, we thought we should be okay. You know, we might have other things to deal with, but hurricanes shouldn't, shouldn't be our main issue. But as a matter of fact, um, a lot of people, I'm sorry, John, but a, a lot of yeah. residents who have left Florida and traveled into the Carolinas, one of the reasons for traveling up into the Carolinas, it's been written about um, yeah. that, that they to were escape the hurricane, the hurricane alley. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. So as we're because, reading and hearing about all the warnings about the hurricanes, we're like, well, we're at 4,200 feet. If, if, if a flood gets to us, you know, we should have built an arc. Right. John, let when, me, let me bring something up here because yeah, to frame it up, right. There had been rain for about three days before September right. 28, when Helene barreled through, through right. your part of North Carolina. Days earlier, a weather front stalled over the mountains. Some areas got more than a foot of rain. When Helene arrived, these mountains were already saturated. There had been three days of rain. Creeks and streams rerouted and grew bigger and stronger. There was nowhere for all that water to go but down. Um, right. So, so the, the ground was already saturated, right? Yes, exactly. We, uh, we went to Asheville uh, for an appointment on, I think it was Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday. And the road, the one road to the office was already starting to flood. And we thought, uh Oh, you know, this isn't even the storm yet. This isn't even the leading bands of the storm. This is just the, the three days of rain before it. And we already had a road that was starting to flood. Where are you um, living in North Carolina? Between Waynesville and Asheville. Uh, we're about 30 miles west of Asheville in the town of Canton. Because my understanding is that the the, the mudslides, right? Yeah. The water up at the 4,200 plus elevation, yeah. that's where, you know, the, the water began, what, the began to run right. down. The, the, the muck, the, the, the ground right. began to give way. And some of that, um, you know, a lot of that just traveled 30 plus 35, I believe it was about 35 miles down yeah. river. Down now, river. It used right. to be stream, but they became rivers. Yeah. To Asheville, or Asheville just took the brunt of it. They got Asheville got got crushed. I I don't know what other word to use for it. Yeah, it was, and that so our road had washed out in three places, and then there was another area that was at risk of being gone. It was at a, a switchback turn. The culvert had, I can't even say branches clogging it. There were trees that had clogged this one, 
Um, so the water was just going right underneath it and the road was completely buckled. Um, you had, you had to crawl over it in first gear. Um, anything more than that and you'd knock your fillings loose. Um, and you didn't want to bounce over it that hard anyway. Not that you really wanted to take your time going over it because I didn't want to be on top of it when I decided to let go. Right. Um, and every time you went over it, it would, I swear it, it would go down like another six inches. So it was, it was hairy. Now, west of us, I-40 was, you know, I'm sure you probably saw those pictures. I-40 was just gone. Um, and there were big signs on the side of the road saying, um, no travel or access to Tennessee is unavailable. And it, I, I was having trouble processing that. You know, I couldn't get from where I was to another state, to, to the adjoining state because there were no roads. They were gone. Last week, I went with a neighbor down to the Veterans Re uh, Restoration Quarters. It was an old hotel that they had repurposed for homeless veterans. And our job that day was to go through the rooms to try to find any personal effects that these guys might have had to leave behind when they when they relocated them. So we were going through the rooms on the first floor of this place. The mud was four to six inches deep, but the water line was about shoulder high. Um, there were some rooms that we actually just had to back out of because you just couldn't breathe in there. While we were there, uh, they found two more bodies in the Swannanoa River right behind the facility. Um, and I just, I wonder how these responders keep compartmentalizing this. You know, when you get your head into a certain mindset of, I'm going to, whatever it is, I'm going to go remove these these three cars from the river. And in so doing, you you stumble across two or three bodies. I mean, these people have to have to deal with this day in and day out. Um, and I just hope that they take some time for themselves, either during or after, um, so that they can come to grips with what they've had to do. The town of Canton had 19 feet of water. I mean, the Pigeon River overflowed and they had 19 feet of water. Oh, my God. Um, so we just went down. Just for perspective, what's usually the depth of those rivers are the, the, the river itself sat a good eight to 10 feet below. I mean, there was a good bank before the river could even crest over that. Mm -hmm. And then to actually get anything, it was like a good 100, 150 yards until it could get to anything. Um, but what I've been learning is some of the problems that they run into is when they'll get some kind of dam that builds up along the river from all the flotsam coming down, down river. Um, that when that all of a sudden lets go, you end up with this wall of water that's like 20, 30 feet high that just comes through and just whops everything in front of it. Tell me a little bit more. Let's go back to the veteran shelter where you said there were, there were a few veterans who were missing. Do you know what yeah. the story is with them? I haven't heard an update on the, on the eight that are still missing. So they, they housed, uh, roughly 150 veterans there. Um, most of them were willing to move to the other quarters when they did their, their evacuation. Um, some weren't willing to, so they struck out on their own. Some went to the homeless camp that was about oh, 200 yards downriver. Um, and the others, they don't, they don't know where they went off to. They just kind of struck out on their own. Two of them were rescued uh, from the floodwaters uh, from that homeless encampment. Um, the one guy, it, it was, it was what, it was what you'd see in a movie. Um, he was holding on to a tree for dear life with his arms wrapped around a tree trunk and his body was just kind of, uh, being pulled by the current, that wicked flood current, um, until the rescue boat got to him and was able to, to get him off the tree and, and, and save him and his, his friend. Um, but the others, I, I don't know yet. Yeah. Um, can you imagine the beating that you take when you're holding oh. on to to anything and, and you're flowing yeah. you're being with the current as with well as everything else is being pulled with the current? Yeah. In front yeah. and behind you and underneath. Oh, my God. This yeah. is like going through a blender. Because this is a relatively temperate area, it's it's home to – weird way to put it. It's home to a substantial homeless population. Um. 
what happened with those people? And does anybody report them as missing? Can you describe where you were at as the hurricane passed? Yeah. Your area? Yeah. And how, I, what I can that tell was you. Like? Sure, sure. About three, three or so in the morning, um, I was awakened when, when the wind really ramped up. Um, and our whole south-facing wall, the one where we have our beautiful views and everything, um, was just getting assaulted by the wind. Um, I'm listening to everything, just pelting the side side of the house and the roof of the house, praying that you know I don't have a, a limb come through. Um, so that woke one of my dogs up, and she felt that that was a good time to go outside. I was still kind of half awake. That's going to be the excuse that I'm going to use. Um, I went over to the door that I usually use to let her out. And that is the door that leads out to the deck, which is on that south facing wall. As soon as I turned that knob, that door came flying in and almost hit me in the face. That's how hard the wind was blowing. So I had to lean with all of my body weight against it to get it closed again and realize just how ignorant that was. So now I'm awake. So I, I went downstairs through the through the garage to let her out because that door is, is sheltered and I, I could let her out. Um, yeah, she took about two steps outside and realized she didn't really have to pee that bad. Um, but that's also when I noticed that my garage was starting to flood. The water pressure on the backside of the house, um, there was so much water in the ground there that it was just pushing through the block and it was starting to, the basement floor was starting to get wet. Was that water flowing um, down stream it downhill? Was, yeah, from, from the from the back side of our house, there's still a little bit of an incline. Um, and the water, even though we had put all kinds of uh, pipes in to route water away from the house, um, I have a big six-inch pipe on either side, to, and it routes it about 50, 60 feet away from the house. And there was still so much water that it was just pushing right through the, the uh, cinder block. Um, not pouring through, but just seeping through enough that the floor was down. Two hours later, the dog wakes us up again. So now she really does have to go out. But when I go downstairs, what had been seeping through is now coming through. And it is now not just in the garage, but it is now stretched into the, the house part where the, where the gym is. And so I go upstairs and get her. And, of course, the shop back died. Um, so we spent the next five and a half, six hours with buckets and rags trying to keep up with the water that's coming in, just bailing water into the sink. During all this, you still hear the wind. You hear the cracks of, of things breaking. You don't hear anything hit the house, but you know that stuff's breaking. You, you can hear it all around you. Listening to that for that long was just, it really put you on edge. The, the advantage was you can kind of go into a uh, an operational mindset. So you can kind of put your emotional thing about, oh my God, what's happening to our house and all this stuff in one place and just kind of, I'll deal with that later. And for now, what do we have to do to get through this right here, right now? Um, check, 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 and, and just kind of go through what can I control, what can I control? What's what's the most important thing that I can control right now? Well, that's the water coming in the house. All right, we'll deal with that. Um, then we had just had brand new windows put in throughout the house. Well, four of them started leaking. Um, it was raining inside the house. The lights blinked. It, it looked like a disco in here because the power was blinking so much. Every light in the house house was like blinking. It looked like a disco. And then all of a sudden there was just a pop and then everything was out. Um, I mean, we have a generator, a whole house generator, as do most of the people up here. Mm. But not no again, back to that not knowing, not knowing what the roads look like and when they might be able to get up here to fill your propane tanks, you have to be very judicious with how you use your, your generator. How long um, were you without power? Six days. Seven days. Six or seven days. Amazing how we take it for granted. Everything we can it do. It is, isn't it? Power. it we can't do. Yeah. yeah, it really is. During the, the hurricane itself, um, the wind, what, what were those sounds like for the people that have never gone through anything like this? It's like standing next to a train and hearing and feeling the wind of a train going by you. But it's like you're standing like right next to the tracks. I mean, it is just this constant or stand behind a, a jet engine. You just 
constantly hear this this rush of wind and every now and then you'd hear a gust but for the most part it's just this constant howling wind uh yeah probably the best would be either standing next to a train or next to a jet engine just non-stop and then add into that the sound of whatever that wind is bringing with it you know the loud crack of a limb or or an entire tree when these big oak trees let go it, it sounds like a rifle shot. I mean, it is just this loud crack, and then the 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 wump of whatever it lands on. Um, if it just lands on the ground, that makes one sound. If it hits something, it makes another sound. The, the crash and the crunch of whatever it just hit. Um, and the whole time you're, you're just this constant tension of just waiting for it to hit the house, um, and just trying to be aware of of where you are in that house. That if that happens. All right, is it going to get me? Let me let me turn to something that's been in the news. A neighboring county was investigating reports of an armed militia, quote, hunting FEMA. One arrest was made. FEMA suspended door-to-door -door operations in western North Carolina for 48 hours. Can you right. shed some light on that? Because that, that's really sure. a thing that's hit sure. national news. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing about FEMA, um, first off, it's it's inaccurate. They've been here. They've been rocking and rolling right right from the start. Um, I think a big part of it, I think there's it's it's like a two pronged problem. One is the Hollywood perception of what FEMA is and does. You know, you're not going to see a flood of these blue helicopters with white lettering that says FEMA on the side. Do they have those? Probably, but that's that's not. They don't push in all the resources. Their job is to coordinate the logistics and fill in any stop gaps that local and state and federal government might have in dealing with the problem. They then become the, the head of that pyramid and look at everything that's available to them, look for any gaps that might need to be filled. They will then find a way to fill that gap, but they will use all the resources that is that are already there and coordinate it so that it makes sense rather than just having this fractured thing of everybody trying to do little things and nothing really gets accomplished. Um, to that point, because of that organization, I think is why you're able to see the recovery going as quickly as what it is. It's still going to be a long drawn out process just because of the scope, but without their oversight and assistance, it would have been catastrophic beyond what it already was. Wherever that started, that's mm -hmm. as bad as the storm or the hurricane, right? Because you're preying right. on people who hurt. Right. Down and out. In this case, fellow Americans were freaking. Right. Bro, we need to come together. Right. <laughs> we need you right. to separate us. We need you to bring us together. Let's let's, right. let's take care of our own. Right. Um. Yeah. So so how are you doing? I mean, look, you went through a traumatic experience. One yet right. one more, right? A life delivery, right. expectedly. Right. Um, when we last spoke, you mentioned about the how triggers for you were sights, sounds, smells. I almost feel guilty. Because as bad as that storm was, it really wasn't that bad for us. My house is still standing. We're all healthy. Um, I got to spend time with my son. Um, and then on the flip side of it, you have people that lost so much. They lost everything. And in your case, you know, you've served public servant, lifelong public servant, a fellow American, a true American hero. Um I can't see you not experiencing that, but what are you doing to to deal with these and overcome the, those those guilt feelings that shouldn't be there? Yeah, I think I think that was a big part of why we did the volunteer stuff, um, why we went out and delivered meals just to to show people that life will be okay. You know, you're alive. You know, and you know, be grateful for that and work through that. Um, yeah, the volunteering helped. And then just trying to get back into a a daily rhythm. Um, that was my, I think, I think that was my first step was just getting back to, into a daily rhythm, um, taking some control of my life back by forcing myself into a daily rhythm. You know, you get up, you do this, you know, you have breakfast, walk the dogs, do this, and just kind of having my daily schedule and my daily rhythm going. Yeah. Um, once I got that sense of normalcy back, um, we would talk about it. And just talk about the things that we we saw, what we felt, what we what we experienced. 
Um, on that note, we've been speaking with uh, retired assistant police chief John Hill, who now lives in North Carolina, Canton, North Carolina, and went through uh, Hurricane Helene. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you can find us on Bets and Badges at all major podcast pl platforms. Look forward to speaking with you on the next one. Thank you.